All right, folks, welcome to the Monsters, Madness, and Magic Podcast. I'm your host, Justin, here with a quick word before we dive in. Now, in this episode, I chat with writer and producer David Kirshner about the true story of his family that influenced an American tale, creating Chucky, the importance of the page master, and more. As always, thank you for listening. And if you'd like to help the show grow, please leave us a review wherever you're listening to the podcast. Anyway, without further ado, here you go. Hello? Welcome to the library, young man. Don't tell me. You're here for a special book. Mm, Mr. Stop, stop, stop. stop. Allow me to guess. I have a talent for guessing what people need. You're in need of... a fantasy. Brave knights. Mythical fairies. Ferocious dragons. Look, all I want is... Adventure! Of course! You're a boy who loves adventure, brimming with wicked demons, cutthroat pirates. No, no, that's not it. (sighs) Evil demons, wretched monsters, haunted houses, graveyards. Yes, it's horror for you, boy. I'm sure of it. Greetings, boils and ghouls. This is your comrade, the Crypt Keeper here, reporting dead from the sanctuary of the strange. Tonight's macabre myth is a fright-filled feature, one overflowing with monsters, madness, and magic. <laughs> Take us back in time to when you were a youngster. Were you a book reader, fort builder, troublemaker, or all of the above? Certainly not a troublemaker. (laughs) Fort maker, for sure. An extraordinary fort maker. I loved building forts and just creating things like forts or haunted houses. I was very big into those. Yes, I was a huge book reader as I continue to this day. Horrendous at sports, which I continue (laughs) to this day. Probably never successfully caught a ball. Loved just being inside and drawing and watching movies and reading comics and books so do you have did you have a genre that you leaned towards when you read or maybe a specific author or favorite stories or something like that i was a huge ray bradbury fan when i was a kid you know as i got to be about 10 or 11 i reached out to him when i was in my 20s i'd read a book of his called the halloween tree because i love halloween so much and have since i was tiny i reached out to him and he wrote back and this pen pal thing started. Every fall I would have lunch with him. In his office, we would have tuna fish sandwiches and potato chips on paper plates that his wife Maggie would bring in for us. When I became chairman of Hanna-Barbera, I sat behind my desk, really the first job, real job I ever had in my life. I created things before that and I was very fortunate with what happened with those things, but I never really had a job that I, <laughs> that I would get dressed decently and get in a car and drive somewhere and sit behind the desk. You know, first adult moment of my life, I guess. I, I was about 33, 34 then. Holy. And, <laughs> and I sat down and I just thought, what, what do I do? And so I called Ray and I said, would you want to make the Halloween tree as an animated film? And he said, by God, let's do it. And so we did it. I love and that so, movie as well. It's the only Emmy that he ever won with all of his work that was on television. He wrote this first and narrated it and won the Emmy. Yeah, he was just so 
excited by that. I always describe Ray as a a 10-year-old boy stuffed into the body of a senior citizen. He he was just, (laughs) he was so boyish and, and so wonderful. But maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, sorry. You're completely fine. Since you just mentioned Hanna-Barbera, so you say, you know, you grow up, you're you're drawing, you're an animator. Is it just nuts for you to finally sit behind that desk and realize that you're the chairman of Hanna-Barbera it, with the little kid and you freak out? For sure. I was scared <laughs> to death. I had never balanced a checkbook in my life. You know, I just thought these guys have made a massive mistake and maybe it was imposter syndrome and I just thought they they thought they had somebody else I made it very clear to them just all my failings but the creative side is is what they responded to and it, and it was exciting when I went in the company was valued at 150 million five years later when I left they sold it for just under half a billion I called Spielberg who I'd had done an American tale with and I said would you be interested in doing uh, Flintstones in live action And he and Kathy Kennedy were so excited by it and did such a great job of that with the director, Brian Levant, who directed that. But yeah, it was it was very exciting, too. I learned a lot and I really grew as as a as a person that just locks themselves in a room and draws or or writes. I really learned a lot as to production. I mean, I'd been a producer prior to that, but I just learned so much just, you know, being responsible for all of these amazingly talented people and and trying to introduce new forms of uh, entertainment to the classics that were at Hanna-Barbera. Well said. And, you know, as a fan, from the outside looking in, it's cool to see you and one of your collaborators, Mick Garris, who I've spoken with. You're both huge Ray Bradbury fans, and I didn't know that. And you both worked together on Hocus Pocus. Did any of that come out when you guys worked together? Or did you guys speak about Ray? Because I know you guys are both huge fans. You know, no, no one has ever asked me that question. It's an excellent question. And I need to ask Mick because I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember if we discussed Ray and the Halloween tree because the Halloween tree was so my inspiration for Hocus Pocus, let alone my my childhood of just being a uh, very committed trick-or-treater and, <laughs> and, build, and builder of haunted houses on my parents' porch that kids had to walk through to get candy. Yeah, Mick and I had met when Stephen was doing amazing stories and I was just starting an American tale. You know, two really young guys in their 20s, we met and we really hit it off. And so when I got to Disney, and we were going to do Hocus Pocus, I went to Mick to see if he would be interested in writing my story. He added so much to it. Just to back up a bit before we get too far from your childhood, David, when you think back to uh, formative films and TV shows from your childhood, what comes to mind initially? Well, there's so much that I was influenced by, and it was so all over the place. Honestly, from Walt Disney to Alfred Hitchcock, Ray Harryhausen, it was the stuff of fantasy. And that just spoke to me from the time I was a little boy. And I really didn't quite understand that it was fantasy. I just knew this is the stuff that I loved. You know, by day, I would soak in all this horror. And by night, my entire family would pay the price because (laughs) I was sure whatever it was that I had watched was in our house. That's the truth. I'm not sure I've changed much at 68. I tend to just kind of absorb all of that and then it comes out of at night. I'm always making my wife crazy with, like, did you hear that? There's someone in the house. There's something going on. And it's just like, she's been hearing this for 46 years and there's never been anybody in the house. But I, I don't know, just kind of an overactive imagination. I made my, I truly, I made my parents crazy with my fears. And, you know, my dad put a moratorium in me watching shows like Chiller on Sundays because everybody paid the price Sunday night. John Kennedy's assassination really did me in because uh, my birthday is the same as Kennedy's. So I was positive that I was next, even though Oswald was dead at that point. So yeah, kind of a overactive imagination to say the least, uh, my poor family had to deal with. So when do you first remember experimenting with short stories and starting maybe to, you know, maybe write your own things? The first real story I wrote, I was about 16. I mean, I always would create characters on paper. I mean, creatures and such. I was always doodling and thinking. And But my first real story that had some substance to it, not just a school assignment, but something that made me say, wow, I think maybe this could be a movie one day. Yeah, I was about 16 when I wrote that. Oddly enough, Michael Jackson became my partner on that project. Sadly, 
you know the rest of that story with Michael. But uh, yeah, we sold it to Fox, and and then after Michael died, I just put it away. And then my wife really encouraged me to go back out with it. And now I have Rock Nation, Jay Z's company, as my partners on this, and we will be going out with it. But I started that when I was sixteen, so and I'm sixty-eight. Wow that math is but it's a long time ago and yeah sometimes it takes me a good deal longer than i would like to get things made better late than never <laughs> better late than never and what i say is you know at least i have the tenacity to stay with it i'm you know i'm not proud of the fact that it takes me a long time you know the first curious george it took me 16 years to get made miss potter on the life of beatrix potter with renee zellweger it took me 14 years to get made but if I believe in them, I, I stay with them. In a few days, they, uh, the past few days, they've uh, announced that they're finally releasing David Allen's Primevals after 40 years. So, wow. Yeah, it's finally finished. I did not see that. That's incredible. Oh, I have to check that out. Yeah, I'm excited about that. It's going to premiere at Fantasia. You kind of already answered this question. I uh, like to ask everyone, what scared you as a kid? Is there any specific thing that you can nail down, like a specific monster under the bed? You know, I was terrified of my sister's dolls. She had a shelf and a nightlight below that. It was like a flashlight, right, against your face when you were little. And those dolls really scared me, which probably attracted me to Don Mancini's Child's Play. His original script was titled Blood Buddy. It had been passed on by every studio in town when it came to me. And I gave my development person a book. My wife and I had just come back from London called The Victorian Dollhouse Murders. And I said to her, I, I would love to make a story about a doll that comes to life like Talking Tina from Twilight Zone. And she said, well, there actually was something that went around about six months ago called Blood Buddy, but everybody passed on it, so there's really no point in you reading it. And I said, well, I'm just curious what this person did with it, with the story. And she said, okay, and I read it. And there was a lot there that I liked. There's a bunch that didn't make sense to me. I took that original Don's concept and, and a lot of his story and rewrote it into 18 pages with stuff that I added and went out and I had five studios bid on it. And Don has written every one of them from the beginning and directed about four or five now of them. And, uh, and is, as we speak, working on the TV show up in Canada. And uh, we just got picked up for our third year. Last year, we were 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. So it was really exciting. You know, we've kept that little bastard going for 35 <laughs> years. So uh, that's, that's a long run for a, a horror franchise. It really is. How did Tom Holland eventually get involved with that first one? So I sold it to United Artists and uh, or went with them, and I met a host of directors. Gosh, I think his name's Weiss. Uh, Robert Weiss, who directed The Sound of Music, was interested in directing it. Weird, right? Yeah. Um, I had lunch with William Friedkin, who was interested in directing it. Irving Kirshner of Star Wars, the second Star Wars. And then I met with Tom, and I really loved his film Fright Night. And mm. I just really enjoyed that. And his screenplay for Psycho 2 was spectacular. I went with Tom. You know, we certainly had our share of problems huh? <laughs> on that movie. It was my first live action film, but there were a lot of a lot of problems. Tom wanted to show the doll constantly. And I kept saying, and I would always do it very politely, but Tom, I, I think you're showing too much of the doll. And, you know, I mean, it goes back to Jaws. Right. Spielberg just teased us and teased us and teased us. Alien was also out by that point, and there was such a tease of, of that creature on the ship that you hadn't seen anything for so long as you watched the film, but you were on edge. Anyway, at the end of the day, we, we cut almost 30 minutes out of the film. It tested horribly, <laughs> horribly. It was very depressing. And when we cut those 30 minutes out, Edward Schulke and I, and I asked Don Mancini to come in on that, the film tested through the roof and it was all kind of built on that. From Don's original script, Tom Holland's contributions, and he had some great contributions. Uh, John Lafia rewrote Don Mancini's original script. Anyway, so the three of them, Don, John Lafia, and Tom Holland share credit on that. And I you know, created Chucky, what Chucky looks like, and then years later, Tiffany, what Tiffany would look like. You're a Fright Night fan, so it was a no-brainer just to bring on Chris Sarandon. Yeah, Tom had that relationship. Mm. That was Tom, and it was such a, a great get. Yeah, we were very, very fortunate to have that. And Brad Durf was also a Tom Holland get. That added tremendously. Originally, we had uh, Mercedes 
Cambridge, who was the voice of Reagan in The Exorcist. But it just, it didn't work. And then Brad came in and just hit it out of the park. And honestly, I, I credit Brad more than anybody with giving Chucky the personality that he has today, because there's a scene in the first film where a woman and her husband get in an elevator and they have food with the tin foil over it or something and they get in this cage elevator and the wife looks down and this doll is sitting in the corner and she says what an ugly doll and then the elevator opens and and they walk out and you just hear brad who completely ad-libbed this say fuck you and the audience went crazy i mean we went crazy when we recorded it we just thought it was really funny but when the audience heard that and it's just like okay wow there's something here that this doll can be more than just this quiet killer and yeah brad durf gave birth to to chucky's uh wise guy wise ass persona for sure when you're writing a story screenplay what have you what does your process look like are you a heavy outliner do you like to fix it later and go with the flow i'm pretty messy about it all i write everything longhand on legal pads and i just start writing I, it just, you know, p- punctuation is thrown out the door. I just start kind of stream of consciousness writing. And that, that is the beginning of my process of just kind of putting a fruit salad down of all these ideas. And then from there, going back and, and refining it. So you've had a fair share of scripts come across your hands. You've written your fair share. What is a indicator that you've got a good one? And what are some red flags? Hmm. For me, if I'm being grabbed in the first 10 or 15 pages, it's working. I recently read a a pilot outline by a a young writer by the name of uh, Tyler Christensen. And the first 15 pages, I just, I mean, my heart was just beating. It was so exciting and so great. It's, It's a takeoff of Sleepy Hollow. I couldn't believe what I was reading and at the same time had complete envy (laughs) and jealousy that I hadn't come up with this and written what he did. And I don't think I could ever touch what he did. He did it so incredibly well, and I'm excited to throw myself into that project. Is that Sleepy Hollow High, by the way? Yes, it is. I saw that on your credits list. I wanted to ask you about it because I hadn't heard of it. Oh, I didn't even know that was out there, okay? We're just putting it together now, but when I read it, it just, you know, the idea of, of a high school in sleepy hollow i mean that exists there is a high school there is a sleepy hollow i mean it it all exists and it's just always in my mind and i wanted to do this with hocus pocus and disney was not particularly interested in making a buffy kind of show of salem of what was beneath those cemeteries and all those tunnels and with pieces of coffin sticking down in those tunnels and bones and but what what other creatures lay there and so when uh, tyler christensen told me about this i was really excited and i I read this and his original script was a a feature film and i just said would you consider doing this as a television series and he said absolutely and so he went and wrote a a pilot that is amazing and so we're we're going to be going out with that but after the strike of course we can't do anything right now we're kind of all uh all on hold right and since you just mentioned it what how are things looking do you do you expect progress to be made with the strike do you how long do you expect this to yeah i I mean right now it, it just seems like both sides are entrenched no one knows but what i'm hearing is that it should be wrapped up by Labor Day. I mean, that's still a ways away, right? I mean, yeah. it's going to hurt a lot of people that won't be able to uh, to get their films made or below the, the line folks that work on films from hair and makeup to editors, just across the board. It's going to affect a lot of people. And it's, I mean, it's, it's a worthwhile strike for sure, but it's certainly going to hurt a lot of people in the meantime. As much as the studios are complaining about it, they'll be fine. It's it's the others that I worry about. Right, indeed. So, David, I grew up on American Tell. So, how did how did you come up with the story, and how do things ultimately get rolling on that project? On American Tale, it's the story of my grandmother coming to America from Russia when she was uh, about seven or eight, and she would tell me this story, and they thought that her little brother Fievel had been washed over because he. He was a very curious kid and he was exploring on the ship and there was stormy weather and then they couldn't find him and and they were all so frightened there were 11 of them uh my grandmother had 10 other siblings and they were on that ship and you know can you imagine trying to keep 11 kids just 
together, but 5 wandered off. And anyway, I love this story. And my, unfortunately, my children never got a chance to meet this wonderful woman, my grandmother. And so I would tell them the story. And then I just decided to start playing with it as maybe an animated film. The first person I took it to, well, the first person I took it to was Jeffrey Katzenberg at Disney. And Jeffrey said to me, who the fuck is going to go see a film about a Jewish mouse? And I said, well, who's going to go see a film about a wooden puppet? It's what you do with those characters. The emotions are, the arc. And he said, nice try. And then actually Norman Lear's company bought it and was going to do it as a, a television special. And then I had the opportunity. There was an article on me in the LA Times that said something like, shy young daydreamer brings his dreams to life. And Kathy Kennedy saw that and she called and asked to meet with me. I didn't know what a Kathy Kennedy was in 1984. <laughs> and she came to my office, I presented it to her, and she didn't laugh, she didn't cry, she did nothing. <laughs> she just said, can I use your phone? People didn't have cell phones back then, not that anybody remembers <laughs> so far back, but they didn't. And she called Stephen, and she said, Stephen, you need to see this kid's work like now. And Stephen said, and, you know, Charlie Brown, I don't, I, I don't know what he said, but it was just like, you know, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> and then Kathy got off the phone and said, so tomorrow, which is July 4th. Stephen is having a 4th of July party. He'd like you and your wife to come and about half an hour early, present this to him and then stay for the party. And yeah, you know, I'd gone from never being invited to any Hollywood kind of party, also not our scene, but never being invited to being at a party where we're standing kind of in the corner looking at over there is Sean Connery, over there is, is Harrison Ford, you know, there's Kathy Kennedy. It's just like, Oh my God. And anyway, I presented it to Stephen and it was one of the greatest moments of my life other than my wife telling me she loved me and the birth of my children and grandchildren for Stephen to say, I love this. What's exciting, what's even more exciting to me is what you have up there. And as you mature in this business, how that will come out. Let's turn this into a movie. And Justin, it has never been that easy ever to make a, a movie. I, I mean, I've made 50 something projects since then, but Stephen just saying, let's turn it into a movie. And it was so, you know, it was just, that's the way it was. It was, it was a very exciting moment. And if we're set up right now, if you're Steven Spielberg and, and I'm me, and I'm showing you everything, just a little over your left shoulder was Liz, my wife sitting in back of Stephen. And I'm, my eyes slowly catching the fact that when Stephen was saying those very kind words to me, she is hysterical and trying not to make noise, but I just see her doing this. And, and I'm so frightened Spielberg's gonna turn around and see this crazy woman hysterical on his couch. But you know, it's just, you know, she's just always believed in me. We've been together since we've been, we met when we were 16. You know, she's just kind of been the rock of, of everything that I've, I've created. She's truly been the, the architect of my dream. She's, she's the MBA, she's the adult in the relationship. She knows how to, balance a checkbook and run life and i kind of go into a room and do what i've done since i've been eight so i'm assuming after stephen blesses you you know he snaps his fingers it's not long after you know don bluth gets involved that's right don bluth then got involved don was rough on me i've, I've got to say um really very rough i remember being in a meeting and stephen and kathy weren't there it was at his studio in van nuys and he just kind of tore into me because i'm I, you had said i'm an animator but i'm not i'm an illustrator and that that's an art that i wish i could do but i i can't and don is and was a genius of of, of such he just said you're you're not you're not an animator you're an illustrator and these characters could never move anyway when stephen heard that he called don and said these are the characters i want make them move and Don did that. And again, he added so much to it, but they were my characters that Stephen really loved so much. And, you know, we, we did a giant screening, or I was invited to a giant screening at the Academy to show an American tale. And Don got up there and thanked everybody by name down to Incan painters and didn't even mention me. Wow. And you know, I just sat there with kind of tears in my eyes, just like so humiliated with my family and friends around. And by the time I got home, the phone was ringing and my wife picked up and said, oh, please hold one second. It was Kathy Kennedy. And she said, I heard what happened tonight. 
she said, I'm really sorry, expect a call from Don Bluth. And I said, oh no, you know, Kathy, don't do that. You know, don't worry about it. it it's, it's not a big deal. Even though I really felt it was a huge deal. And she said, expect the call, she hung up. And about 10, 15 minutes later, Don called and said, I'm so sorry. I was jet lagged and I forgot. And I, you know, I don't know how you forget the guy that created it and, and co-wrote the story and shares the screen credit with Steven Spielberg, yeah. but he did. Later on, when I did some other films, Don wrote me a, a, some very nice notes. And so in fairness to him, but I, I think that he was just kind of bothered because I think he had wanted to make a film with Spielberg for years and here this punk comes in and who's not an animator and not a brilliant animator like, like himself, but he, he did a beautiful job in the film. He really did. And James Horner's music just, you know, makes it mm. soar that much more. The the work that they did, James Horner and Cynthia Wilde and Barry Mann that wrote all the songs for it. You know, they got Academy Award nominations. They won an Emmys for it. Such talented people. I'm kind of just making this connection in my head. Sorry, but uh, did your love of Fright Night eventually lead to Roddy McDowell being inserted into Pirates of Darkwater? No. <laughs> no, that, was, that just worked out really well. It's funny, I've never connected that. You're right. That's right. He was in, but yeah, he played uh, the character of Nidler in, in Pirates of Dark Water, and that was a real honor to uh, to work with him. But I've never put that together. Yeah, that it just just happened. I, I yeah, have said that to him when I when I met him. It was uh, it was so fun to be able to work with him. And what a legend! Did you know Pirates of Dark Water before? I w- yeah, I watched it. I watched Pirates of Dark Water. I was going to oh, ask wow. you how you came up with the concept for it because it's, it's a cool idea. I love pirates. I have a book downstairs in my library here that says Spielberg had given me on Howard Pyle's. Howard Pyle was a, an amazing illustrator and ran a school that Norman Rockwell was a part of, N.C. Wyeth. It, it just some of the greatest illustrators of our time went to this school and went on to just illustrate incredibly. And anyway, I was a huge fan of, of Howard Pyle's and Stephen got me this book and I just in thumbing through it, I just wondered about the idea of a world of fantasy pirates. That's kind of where all of that came from. And, um, you know, very influenced by Joseph Campbell, for sure. Mm. Um, Joseph Campbell's work and George Lucas has said there would be no Star Wars if it wasn't for Joseph Campbell. George being humble, I, I, I don't know. Um, I think he would have done it anyway. George would have created Star Wars anyway. But, you know, for all of us, it's certainly help that was that his writings and teachings for me were very instrumental and i really used those in pirates of dark water it was really really a uh, a fun project to work on it became a marvel comic i, I don't know if you're aware of that, i did not know that yeah 12 or 13 comics they did and then we had yeah and then it became a a, a line of toys and uh, and then we did the animated when i got to Hanna-Barbera, and other than the classic Hanna-Barbera characters, that was one of the new creations for the, the studio. And they did a gorgeous job on that. We spent a lot of money per episode on those. And over the years, there have been so many fans saying, you've got to remake this, you've got to remake this, and consider it in live action. And, I, and I'm doing that. I really am. I, I would really love to be able to go back and do that in a, uh, in a live action form. That would be extremely exciting. Uh- You've got a lot of highlights for me, David. I told you that before we even spoke, but uh, the Page Master is another staple in my household growing up. And I've always wanted to ask you, the stories that are within the story, you know, Treasure Island, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, Moby Dick, and so on, were those chosen specifically? Did they have any sort of meaning to you growing up, or did was it just for the story? Oh, no, absolutely. I mean, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, Robert Louis Stevenson, writes Treasure Island and is the toast of European society and then turns around and writes The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde in the London Times say, says he should be banned from Victorian society and then turns around and writes A Children's Garden of Verses. And I just, I love people that can go from one extreme to the other. And, you know, Walt Disney, I think, understood that and took the best of Grimm's and weave that into his fairy tales and stories and you know scared us made us laugh made us cry so i I, elements coming together are are really really important to storytelling and i don't know i i just really responded to all of that and you know all all the books in there are books that i i read or probably the toughest one for me to get through was moby dick um i did it (laughs) but that was a tough read 
but you know, but the the visuals of that in my mind of of what that could be, and our the director was Maurice Hunt, who did such a beautiful job on on that film. It's another film I'd love to remake in live action if I could. I'm not sure if I'll ever have that opportunity, but you know, I love libraries. I mean, I have books so many books on libraries. I have a library downstairs that's hand carved and I just I love that world. I love stepping into a world that you have to whisper in and and all around you are are the ghosts of authors and their imaginations that swirl in my head every time I, I walk into a library or my own. And so the idea of, of a kid, a bit of a neurotic kid with some fears I was a bit like that myself and maybe still am. The idea of that kind of character being stuck in that world and his growth through these incredible books. You know, I mean, there's some bad reviews on it, like what a stupid idea to make a movie about books. I, I just, I've never understood that. No, um, I don't, yeah, I wouldn't worry about that for two seconds. That's one of the most powerful movies of my childhood, kind of fostered uh, my love for reading. I wouldn't even pay attention to anything that says negative words about it. <laughs> wow, that's... That's enormously generous of you, and that touches me greatly, and I will share that with my wife later today. <laughs> uh, Thank you. Uh, yeah, no, that means a lot. You know, working with Christopher Lloyd, wow. You know, Macaulay Culkin at the height of his career. It was really, it was really just so great to work with all those talented, talented people that, uh, that we had on that film. Just to uh, kind of switch to Mick Garris for a second in Hocus Pocus, I don't know the specifics of you know what Mick worked on and what you wrote, but how does that come together when you're working with a team of writers, and how does it affect the final product? There really wasn't a team at that point. I mean, there would be a lot of writers on Hocus Pocus. Mick got credit. He wrote the first script. Neil Cuthbert came in towards the end and really punched up comedy with that film. There was my original story about witches that are brought back from the dead by a bunch of, of kids on, on Halloween night. And basically we, it, so it starts with my story and then Mick took that and really added fantastic elements, really made it spooky, not, not scary. We were both aware that it was Disney. Disney made us pull back a, a good deal. I mean, one of the reasons I wanted Mick was because of what he does so well. But I do give Disney credit, especially Disney in the early 90s, that here was a story about witches that suck the lives out of children and they're brought back from the dead by lighting a candle from the fat of a hanged man. I mean, they're not generally Disney themes and yet Disney did, did let us keep those. So I, I do give them credit for it. But, you know, I mean, when I think of, there were so many writers that honestly I've forgotten most of their names that worked on it, but Mick and, and Neil Cuthbert were really, I think, the guys that, that really moved it, it forward. And then going into Kenny Ortega's hands, Kenny, who would do High School Musical and, and Descendants, and now is a giant deal at Netflix. But he, you know, he just added so much to it. And one of the great, I think, people's favorite moments in the movie is something that I almost completely screwed up because when I saw what was being planned, which wasn't in mixed script or Neil's, it just the studio said, it's Bette Midler, we need a dance sequence. And Kenny worked out this whole thing to, I, I put a spell on you. And I just thought, oh, that's a huge mistake. What are you doing? <laughs> right? you're, you're stopping the action for Bette Midler to sing a song. You can't do that. You can't do that. And I don't think I've ever been more wrong about anything. It's people's favorite mo moments <laughs> in the movie. I'm the first to say I was wrong. And Kenny was so right. And he was such a gentleman about it because I just said, Kenny, I'm concerned about this. And he said, David, I think it's going to be a showstopper. I said, well, I'm worried it's going to stop the story. He said, it's not. It is not. It's going to be something people love. Uh, I have no idea how he knew so strongly that this would be so successful. And it was. People just love it. And all these years later, they still love that scene. I can hear the song in my head right now. No, it's, it's hard to get out once it's in. <laughs> and yeah, so, you know, that was, again, working with people from, you know, your basic story or idea, and then working with people that just continue to make it better and better and better. And that, you know, I mean, for me, there's a lot of people that don't feel this, but for me, film is so collaborative. And to me, what I've created has become so much better with other people putting their stamp on it. 
touched on many projects here. Obviously, your work is very varied. So is there a specific project that you would consider your most challenging, maybe one you lost the most sleep over? And I say, you know, I look around my office and all these posters and I, they're all the things that have made me great, you know, because there's always a problem. I mean, there's always something, you know, no, no matter what, there's always something. You know, look, uh, an American tale just was, even though there were some issues with Don, my first project, my first project is with Steven Spielberg, which yeah. is like, that will remain something that is so important to me. But, you know, working with Don Mancini on the, on the Chucky films has been wonderful for 35 years. Obviously, Hocus Pocus, I think, is that and American Tale are, are two that mean so much to me because they have so much to do with my own childhood. And then Hocus Pocus started as a bedtime story for our daughters and then became this thing that then Jeffrey Katzenberg did buy. I don't know if I could say one, but those two really stand out for me because they my childhood means so much to me. I, I lost my dad when I was pretty young, but until that point, it was this Norman Rockwell childhood and life changed pretty quickly after that. But it really, I don't know, my childhood was filled with magic and imagination and parents had understood that this kid was never going to win a sports scholarship <laughs> and really supported my, my love of, of drawing and taking my dad's uh, Super 8 camera and making stop motion little movies and uh you know the shows that i would put on for my friends uh that usually were scary i was lucky to have parents that really understood this this kid and really helped me a great deal i think they were just being good parents i don't think they thought oh he's going to be a filmmaker one day but i think they were just good loving parents that made sure i had the tools that i needed to try to be creative with and you know it's just wild while i got you here just got to tell you you know two of the earliest projects that you've worked on that you said were hocus pocus being a story for your children that's wild for me to think about you know those are two american tale and hocus pocus are two cultural staples almost because before i was doing this interview i was telling my mother-in-law that you you know i'm interviewing the guy you wrote american tale and she's going she said american tale oh my goodness she's 60 years old and she started singing the somewhere out there so wow. <laughs> that just shows you just knows no age and that's just how stuck in the zeitgeist those two things are yeah I pinch myself sometimes <laughs> and honestly it's the truth that i, I you know I, yesterday my eyes filled with tears because my wife said to me when we were at that funko pop giant store she said look around i mean there's there's disney there's there's Lord of the Rings. There's all of these amazing things. And you have Chucky here. You you have uh, an American tale. You have Hocus Pocus here. You have Hanna-Barbera. And I don't look at things like that. I just kind of live in that insecure moment of a creative person and thinking, yeah. I'm never going to create anything good again. And when she said that, and I kind of looked at all this stuff, it, it really hit me. And I think the older I get as well, because I'm closer to that end of the field than, uh, than than the other side of the field when I was much younger. You know, it, it, this stuff really, I don't know, has a, an, an effect on me, good or bad. It just, uh, it, it makes me, it touches me that to hear things like that. So thank you for sharing that. And thank your mother-in-law as well. <laughs> I'll let her know. So David, what's the best writing advice you've received and who gave it to you? Well, Ray Bradbury said to me, get up every day and write. He said, that's what I do. He said, sometimes it's, <laughs> he's, his quote, it's horseshit, but he said, but out of that horseshit, you're going to find some diamonds. And though I, I must confess, I don't do it every day. I really try to do it an awful lot during the course of a week, but sometimes other elements of life from being a dad to being a, a grandfather and a, a husband and, and son, you have to balance these things. But I'm always thinking, I'm always dreaming. When we get in the car, it's funny, when our grandkids were younger, we pulled up once to their house. They just lived around the corner and I was driving. They had never seen me drive because my wife usually, almost always drives because I love looking at the window. I love watching people. I love watching light and shadows. And But they had no idea that I could even drive. They just said, Poppy, what are you doing? Why are you driving? Do you know how to drive? <laughs> And it's just because I just I love observing life and I, you know, sitting in airports or malls and just watching people. I don't know. I, I just get inspired by that and by faces and sometimes sketching those faces. And then from that, staring at that face and creating a story from that. Some people may say that's that's ass backwards, but I don't know. For me, it, it seems to work. Whatever way it works is the right way. 
you know, this is something I like to ask everyone just because you never know what they're going to say. Have you ever had an experience you would consider supernatural or paranormal? I can't say I've had that. I've certainly searched for that. I remember we were in London with our kids and I said to our, well, I said to both of them, tonight, look at this great, we were in Manchester, look at this great old cemetery. Let's come back here at midnight tonight and just walk through the cemetery to the back wall. We'll touch the wall and then we'll come running out. The younger daughter did not want to do that, Jesse. Our older daughter, Lexi, did, and we did it. It was a really witchy night. And did I feel things? Yes, but I don't know if that was my eight-year-old imagination. I mean, we were both really scared, but laughing, but holding on to each other. The wind was just whistling through the trees. Trees were just moving. I mean, it couldn't have been a more perfect night to go to this ancient cemetery. And, you know, I, I can't say that I felt that. The same daughter, by the way, when she was just about two, very articulate, we took her to an aquarium not far from here, and we had ice cream, and we walked to the side of, of a cliff where there was a chain link fence so you couldn't fall over. And I said, Lexi, that's the ocean. And she's just staring. And then all of a sudden her hand went like this. I said, Lexi, that's the ocean. Are you okay? And she said, I know. I was here a long time ago and I fell and hurt my head. And I said, what? And she said, I was here a long time ago and hurt my head. And it just, I mean, my wife and I looked at each other. We had goosebumps all over. It was like, oh, right, let's go look at the seals. And we were, it really kind of freaked us out. And about two weeks later, I was pushing her on her little swing in our yard. And I said, Lexi, remember when you said you were at the ocean before? You had never been at the ocean. And she said, no, Daddy, I was a long time ago. And that's when I fell and hit my head. And God took me to heaven and then set me down to be with you and Mommy. And it's just like, whoa. I mean, that it, it really, it's still, I mean, you know, our whoa. daughter's 43 and she was two then. It really, it really set me over the edge. And uh, I mean, in a fascinated way by this, but I think that's the closest to an encounter that I've really ever had. It's not that I've seen ghosts. I would like to. It's not that I've seen creatures, but just with my own daughter who, she has no memory of it today, but I read all these books on it, and it said that children, usually under five, have a memory of some kind of a, of a past life. Whether this is true, whether she was just making it up, I mean, she was such a tiny kid, truly tiny, but wow, it, it just, it, it blew us away. I'll say that so counts. That, that, that's my closest encounter, if you will. That definitely counts. <laughs> well, David, uh, I would thank you for giving me some of your time here. So just so we can put a bow on everything, what's on the horizon for you? And what can you share without getting in too much trouble? Well, we're doing Hocus Pocus 3. The third season of Chucky is being shot right now by Don Mancini. We have a horror film titled Vulture that, depending on the strike, that we hope to shoot in fall. And Through the Horn, which is that musical project that Michael Jackson had been my partner on, that's my next big, big one that I've created. And it's got all the movers and shakers that are in black music today that are artists or, or producers that are, producers are my producing partners, but uh, the, the musical people will be the ones uh, part of this gi giant fantasy about, uh, about uh, black music in America. Wow. And I'm, I'm really excited because the last big fantasy project that was African-American in any way was The Wiz. Yeah. And that's a long time ago. So I'm, I'm very excited by uh, this story. As I told you, I started, started this story when I was 16. You know, I have all my art here and my, my three-dimensional models and everything else on on this project so it's it's pretty exciting to me i i hope we can make it happen because uh i'm not saying it's my swan song but that's up there with my swan songs for sure i hope it does happen david and like i said thank you again for giving me some of your time it's been a pleasure to chat with you man big thank fan. you justin you're, you're such a gentleman and such an excellent interviewer you made me think of things that i've never thought of before I hope we have an opportunity to meet in person one day. Thank you, sir. That'd be a, a pleasure. I'll let you get out of here, and I'll send you a link to this when I get it posted and edited and all that good stuff. Thank you so much. All right, folks. That's a wrap. I hope you enjoyed that chat with David. As always, thanks for listening, and we'll see you back next time. Monsters, madness, and magic. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha! 
Welcome to the night. You think you know Night Demon? Then the Night Demon Heavy Metal Podcast is for you. Step into the darkness as we peel back the curtain to give you an unprecedented, all-access look into the mind and the heart of the demon. We're talking band history, song analysis, studio anecdotes, stories from the road. It's everything a diehard Night Demon fan could want and more. This is the only place to learn the inside scoop, the deep dive trivia, the untold tales from the band members themselves and those closest to the Night Demon story. Need more? The sacred Night Demon crypt will be pried open to reveal demo recordings that have never before seen the light of day. All with in-depth commentary by the band and the people who were there for the writing and recording process. This is a gold mine, a treasure trove of all things Night Demon. Head over to nightdemon.net or wherever you listen to podcasts. Listen to podcasts. Listen to podcasts.